Anybody counting? Somebody should be counting. So they're going by. A lot of blessings this morning. The reading of Scripture first. I want to read the passage before we go through it. But the reading of Scripture is Mark chapter 9, 30 through 41. I'm going to be reading out the Pew Bible. So if you want to follow along, feel free to do so. But a reading of God's Word this morning, Mark 9, starting in verse 30 through 41. And God's Word says, They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum when he was in the house. He asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can, my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ, will certainly not lose his reward. The reading of God's word. Before I get started this morning, I just wanted to kind of give you a little preaching schedule of what I'm going to be doing. Of course, this Sunday, we're covering this passage of Scripture. Uh, Wednesday night, we'll have the service um, with the emphasis on the word come. Then next Sunday, we will cover Mark 9, 42 through 50, and that will allow us to end that chapter, chapter 9. Then the first Sunday in December, our children are going to be a part of the program on Sunday morning, and we'll have a sermon that's theme-related. The second Sunday in December is our Christmas cantata with the choir and the children. The third Sunday is the March to the Manger, and there'll be a sermon that's related to that. And then the fourth Sunday will be the Sunday prior to the new year, and we'll have another Sunday that's kind of themed toward that. And then the first Sunday in January, then we will be back in Mark, at Mark chapter 10. So this is going to work out great. I titled this sermon, I'm Number One. Now, you've been to sporting events where this has happened, right? You've done this before, haven't you? You've been in the bleachers on the sideline, and the cheerleaders get you to start going saying, we're number one. Right? Have you been there? Have you done that? Yeah, let's try it this morning. Are you ready? You ready? We're number one. We're number one. Oh, man, there's even action going back there. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I'm sure that there's a few of you that probably went, I'm not sure we're supposed to say that in church. I'm not sure. Especially, what if I would have said, okay, this is what I want you to do. We're going to do this cheer. I want you to do this. Uh, union is number one. Yeah, you'd probably like, I'm not sure sure I want to say that because I'm not quite sure we're supposed to kind of say that stuff in church. Well, I want you to hold on to that feeling. I want you to hold on to that feeling because we're going to get to that. But if we back up a little bit from last week, the disciples had been told by Jesus that they had abandoned prayer. They had a man that came to them with a son who had been demon-possessed since childhood brought him to Jesus, but Jesus wasn't there. He was up on the Mount of Transfiguration, brought him to his disciples that were remaining there, and the disciples could not cast out the demon. And, and when the disciples said, why couldn't we do it? 
it gave a big clue of why they couldn't do it is because they were relying on themselves rather than on him. And they had abandoned prayer. They had abandoned calling on God for the casting out of this demon. And in essence, what happened, they abandoned his supreme position in their lives. And so Jesus corrected them and said, hey, this only happens when there is prayer. When there's prayer to me, to the heavenly Father. And all, everything is hinged on him, nothing upon ourselves. So a huge lesson that they learned. So now we go into verse 30. From there, they went out and began to go through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know about this. So they're up here in this kind of region up here, and they're going through Galilee, and where are they headed to? They're headed to Jerusalem. And why are they headed to Jerusalem? Because they need to fulfill the plan that Jesus said was going to happen. So verse 31 gives us the plan. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he says that twice there, he will rise three days later. I put down on your sheet, third time a charm? This is the third time that this is addressed now in the gospel according to Mark. The first time that Jesus gives the plan, Peter resoundly rejects it. Remember that? And Jesus comes back and calls him what? Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Kind of thing. The second time, they're up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Moses and Elijah visit Jesus, and what are they talking of while they're on the mount? They're talking about the plan. So now here is the third time that Jesus says, the reason we're going to Jerusalem is because I'm going to, be, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to go rise on the third day. Now, verse 32, how do they respond to this third time? But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. It's the third time you've heard it. But the statement that they were, uh, didn't understand was this. They didn't understand Jesus calling himself the Son of Man. See, the son, he called it Son of God and, and other titles to Jesus and the Messiah and the Savior. But this time he says the Son of Man. And that is a specific title used in the Old Testament in specific places when it talks about the Messiah. And the one specific place it's used is in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. This is the prophet Daniel. He gets this vision and he's going to use that term when he talks about the Messiah. So they could have been thinking about this p very familiar passage to them. I kept looking in the night visions, this is Daniel, and behold within the clouds of heaven one like the Son of Man. That's me underlining it there. The Son of Man was coming. And he came, the Son of Man came up to the Ancient of Days. That's another term for God. Jesus was presented before God, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples and nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And see, I can understand the disciples going, wait a minute here, he just said son of man, but this is the son of man passage. And what Jesus is talking about, about him being rejected and suffer and being killed and rise again, doesn't, doesn't match up with that. I mean, that, that, that's like triumphal Jesus there. They're about kingdoms and dominions and, 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 and conquering, but, but it doesn't match up. And I can understand why they might have been confused over that. But as we learned last week, what Jesus is trying to do is Jesus is trying to show them that the Messiah doesn't come once, he comes twice. And the first time he comes is signified by suffering. The first time he comes. The second time is with triumph. There's two times that Jesus comes. And he's helping his disciples understand this. I put down there, the disciples still had the refrigerator magnets up that promoted one side of Jesus. I like that image. On their refrigerator, they, don't, they didn't have refrigerators, but on their refrigerator, their Jewish refrigerator, they had these magnets. And, yet, and they had triumphal Jesus magnets up there. They didn't have any magnet, refrigerator magnets up there that said, suffering Jesus. No, they didn't have any of those up there. And sometimes we might get hard on disciples about that, but sometimes we do it too. 
We do the same thing. We might promote one side of Jesus more than the other. Or we might lean that way. So let me give you one there. Is, is Jesus a God of love or justice? What's the answer? Yes, yes I know. You, you people are just like way too religious. I mean, you know all the answers. and uh, Yeah, yeah, we, we know that. We do. We do. Biblically, we know that. We know it's yes and it's both and, and everything else. But we tend to lean one way or the other. We tend to emphasize one side more than the other. And, and the problem is, is when you get to the extremes of that. So you can be on this side that God is love. I mean, way to the extremes. Oh, God is love, 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 love. Oh, you made a mistake. Oh, you made a little boo-boo you made. Oh, don't worry about that little boo-boo. God just, go over, he just loves you. Jump up in his arms and he'll just, uh, yeah, God is love. Or you could be the other side. You could be way over here. And God is justice. And there's a line. Ah, you cross over the line. Mm-mm, mm-mm, ah. You're done. You're done. Yeah, you might as well pack your bags and head out. Yeah, it's a done deal. You're not going. Yeah. But it's when we realize that it's both, that actually God's got to be both. God's got to be both. Because when you know that God is love, that he would, what, send his only son to pay the price, to pay the justice needed for us to have eternal life, and then when you realize that we are all sinners and we do, there is something to be paid, that a God of love would do that? I mean, they work hand in hand together. But we tend to lean one way or the other at times. So the disciples are not doing something that they don't do. So what happens after this? Verse 33. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them, what were you discussing on the way? Of course, they're traveling down this road. And Jesus asked another question, and we have, he's asked a lot of questions. And so that's not out of character for Jesus to ask one more. What were you discussing? I think the NIV said, what were you arguing about on the road while we were walking down here? And this could have been Peter's house. There's a difference there between house and a house it doesn't say he went into a house because that would have been any house it says he went into the house so apparently he had been in this house before and many believe that maybe it was peter's house because peter was his home was in capernaum why didn't they well the next verse verse 34 but they kept silent so jesus asked a question they didn't answer the question they kept silent for not for, and that's a misprint there, sorry about that, for on the way, for on the way, they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Why didn't they answer the question? They, they didn't answer the question just the same reason you guys were feeling like when we cheered, we're number one, we're number one. You're like, I'm not sure if we're supposed to do that in church. Yeah, they didn't answer the question because they were like they had been discussing things that they knew they probably shouldn't have been discussing. And they, 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 and they got caught. They got caught discussing this. But you could see this happening. You know, Peter, James, and John went up on the mountain, the other nine down here. They're on the trip to Capernaum. Peter, James, and John are talking to the rest of the nine. Mm, sorry about that. We got to go up the mountain. You didn't. Yeah, we got to see something. Can't tell you what it is. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. We're the chosen ones. We're one, two, and three. Or you could maybe see this happen too with the disciples where they just heard about Jesus using the term son of man. And so that means dominion and everything. Well, dominion means a kingdom. And you could say, well, wait a minute. He's setting up his kingdom. If he's setting up his kingdom... What do we do? We got to get in position because there's positions in kingdom. So you can see the disciples, why they may have had that conversation that was going, but they didn't answer him. So what's Jesus do? Look at verse 35. Sitting down. That, I hope you've understood that now. What happens when Jesus sits down? He's going to teach, and he's going to teach a major teaching. And he, that sign of authority was when the teacher sits down and speaks. So different than today, isn't it? I should be setting. But we haven't, we haven't gotten to that point yet. But um, 
But he sits down, he calls the twelve and says to them, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all. And then the biggest word there is and, and servant of all. I want you to see that because he's, he's not just saying last of all, just being last, but he's saying last and at the same time, servant of all. So here's the major teaching that Jesus gives here. And the major teaching is that God's system and the world system are very different. God's system and the world system are very different. They're not apples to apples. There are apples and oranges and apples and pomegranates and any other fruit you want to throw in there. Apple and banana. Um, I'm hungry right now. So um, it, they're not the same. And therefore, if they're not the same, what matters to God? That's the question you've got to ask yourself. What matters to God? If God's system and the world system are so different, what matters to God? In a world system, let's say we have a physical race that we're going to run. In the world system, what matters is the guy who's on the top podium and the guy who won the race, the guy who has the gold medal on. I mean, that's the one that gets the press. That's the one that gets in the paper. That's the one that in our world system, that's the guy right there. That's the gal right there. But in God's system, in this race called life, God looks down on the situation and sees this race of life that people are going through and he sees this person who in the race of their life is going along and someone falls and they stop and they help them get back up. And, and, and some other situation arises over here that draws their attention and he comes over, that person stops and goes over and gives attention to what's needed there. And there's something else that happens over here and, and he stops over here and he does that. And in the race of life, in the world system, it looks like this guy's coming in dead last. Because why? Because he's stopping all the time to serve these people. But in God's system, God looks down on that and goes, he doesn't look at the person on the podium. He looks at that person and goes, winner, there's the winner, right there. Now, if that's God's system and world system, then you have to ask this question of yourself. Are you selfish or selfless? What describes you? I, I think we could ask that as a church, too. Are we a church that is selfish or selfless? We'll come back to that. Verse 36. Many times when Jesus gives a major teaching, we'll use a physical example to follow up. So that's what he's doing here. Taking a child. And so he set him before them. So it must have been this child was, could stand. And taking him in his arms, so he's still small enough that he could take him in his arms at that point. He said to them, whoever receives one child like this, this kind of child, this age, this, this kind of situation that they're in, in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives, does not receive me, but him who sent me. So here we have this physical example that Jesus gives. And I want us to focus in on this child. This chi Do we have the name of this child? No, we don't have it. It's an unnamed child. Could have been maybe, if they were in Peter's house, could have been maybe one of his kids. We don't know about that. We also have the description of this child being enough to stand, but also able to take in Jesus' arms. Is this child uh, independent? No, no. This child in this state is very dependent. Very dependent on other people to serve that child, to take care of that child, to give that child the basic needs that it needs and everything else. So, so that's the state that this child is in. Now this child, in the state that it's in, can, can this child, in the world's eyes, give you something materially? At this point? No. No. Can't. Really. No, 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 the scale is really tipped here that this child, you are going to be putting out way more than this child can give back in the world system. I know you get love back from a child and, and maybe this child will develop into being somebody really famous and you could look back and go, I babysit that child, <laughs> you know. But, but, but as far as it goes in this illustration, this child needs help. And he says, okay, when you take an unnamed, one who is really dependent, one who desperately needs help. 
and you receive that one and you serve that one and you take that one in, you understand me. You understand who I am. Why? Because God sent what? His son. To who? A bunch of nobodies. <laughs> A bunch of nobodies who are super dependent on someone taking our place on the cross. That's why he came. Jesus came to what? To be served? No. He came to what? To serve. So, this would be a great place to end the passage right here. Actually, he should have. That, that, that John should have said, can you leave off 38, please? But 38 says... John said to him, said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and tried, and tried to prevent him because he was not following us. Did the disciples get it? Mm -mm 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 -mm. No. Here's an unnamed man. Here's an unnamed man. They don't even have the guy's name. I mean, he's casting out demons. Come on, don't you think you would get his name? Unnamed man, casting out demons. He's doing something good in the name of Jesus. Okay? And notice, it's something that they had just failed to be able to do. They, they, they had a situation brought up to them, and they couldn't do it because they weren't calling on the name of Jesus. And so now here's an unnamed guy over here who, who they don't even have his name, but he is speaking in Christ's name, and he's able to cast out the demons. So what do they resort to? They criticize him. They want to throw him out. Wait a minute, you're not supposed to be able to do that. You're not one of the 12. Who are you? Where have you been? He could have been one of the 70 that God sent out. He could have been one of them. But, but here they are criticizing someone doing good in the name of Christ that they knew that they were supposed to be doing. Have you ever done that? Verse 39 and 40. But Jesus said, do not hinder him. I want to think, Jesus said, what? <laughs> what are you doing? I, I'm not sure if that's right, but do not hinder him. For there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name. Who's in charge of the miracle? Jesus is in charge of the miracle. The man's not in charge of the miracle. Jesus is in charge of the miracle. No one will perform a miracle in my name and not be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. Who's even in charge of the words that come out of his mouth about Jesus? Jesus is in charge of that. He's in charge of that. For he who is not against us is for us. He's in control of all that. I think what the disciples had is sometimes we as Christians can do this in churches where it's us four and no more and shut the door. That's kind of our attitude. It's us four and no more and shut the door. I remember the first church I was in. First, they had a Tuesday morning prayer meeting. I was blown away. I'd never been in a church that had a Tuesday morning prayer meeting. I mean, whoa, this is a holy place. They had Tuesday morning prayer meeting. And there was a, there was a group of elderly ladies that came, and I was trying to be the best, you know, pastor I could be you know and I was all dressed up and everything and and we got together to pray and we we did a little bible study and we went into prayer and and uh oh Barb and oh I can't Luella Luella was there and we got down we knelt down to pray we knelt down at the pews to pray and Barb was praying she got done praying and and then I thought well I'll wait until I'm last you know because I'm I'm the pastor now and Luella prays, and Luella starts out praying, and she said, God rest her soul, she's in heaven, okay. Um, she said, Heavenly Father, we just love our little church. We just love the people who come here. Thank you for just keeping us just the way we are. And we just, we just, we're just so thankful that we know everybody here, and we're, we're just so thankful we're small like this. I just come out of college, and I'm like, ah, uh, how do I pray after that? I know what I want to pray. But sometimes we can get that way. Uh, be blatantly honest. Been in churches for 30 years. Sometimes 
God will bring into our congregation new people, new believers. And sometimes, you know what we do? You can just kind of stay over there for a while, okay? Um, we'll, we'll, you know, there's a five-year minimum here to get out of the new bracket in church. And, and yeah, you can serve those lower positions and everything else, but you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a line that we have for you to line up with what, if you're really in, if you're really in here, kind of thing. And you're just, you're not there yet. So just wait, wait patiently. And it's very easy to get into that. And I tell you that, I, I'm not pointing a finger at us. Well, I tell you that because we got to be ready when God opens up the doors of this church. And he floods in here people who, who love God or are going to come to love God. And we got to make sure that we don't do this to them. We got to make sure that Jesus doesn't say to us, What are you doing? What? You hindered them? We've got to make sure that we're ready to love them. And, and they're not new very long. No, no. You can say new for a couple weeks, but they're not new very long. Verse 41. Or wait, no, not 41. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is my famous. This, this is what I, the whole thing is about this right here. I love this. There is a mirrored event in the Old Testament of this event. Mirrored event. There's a thing in the Old Testament that shows this exact same thing happening thousands of years before to this happening right now. So the event that happened was here's a man who was doing something in the name of Christ, something good, and John and the rest of the disciples shut him down. Said, and and then Jesus comes back and said, what? What are you doing? Why did you do that? In the Old Testament, if you have your Bibles, it's not going to be up on the screen, on your Bibles, no, Numbers chapter 11, starting at verse 16. Numbers chapter 11, starting in verse 16. Now, the setting. The setting of this is that the Israelites are in the desert on the way to the promised land. God has provided, departed the Red Sea. God has provided water from the rock. God has provided manna from heaven miraculously every single day, kind of thing. And the Israelites are what? Complaining. They're complaining because they don't have what? Meat. They don't have any meat. And they're compla- they've been walk- they walk through on dry ground. They have pillar of cloud. You know, all that kind of stuff. And they're complaining they don't have enough meat. They don't have any meat. And it would actually be better if they went back to Egypt. We, at least we had meat in Egypt. Now, at this conversation, it says in the scripture that God is angry. Slightly angry. Slightly angry. Moses is outright frustrated. And he comes to God and he says, I can't do this anymore. This is just way too much for one guy to do. I need some help. And so we get to verse 16. This is where we pick it up. The Lord therefore said to Moses, gather for me 70 men from the elders of Israel. So these are godly men, people who are, uh, are caring for the people of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and their officers, and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand with you. Then I will come to you and speak with you there and I will take off of the spirit of who is upon you and I will put it on him, put him on them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you will not bear it alone. So that's, here's God's plan. God's plan says, get these 70 guys, bring them to the tent of meeting, and the spirit that has been upon you to, to care for all of these Israelites, I'm going to put that spirit upon these 70 guys, and those 70 guys along with you are going to be able to administrate everything that needs to be done with the Israelites. Sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? Sounds like he's answering Moses' prayer. Verse 18. Say to the people, consecrate... See, he has to go into this because that was just one part of the equation. There's another thing that needs to be dealt with here. Verse 18. Say to the people, consecrate yourself for tomorrow, for you shall eat meat. And everybody yelled, Yay! For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Oh, that someone would give us some meat to eat. For we are, were well off in Egypt. 
Therefore, the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and you have wept before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? So he says, you want meat? I'll give you meat. I'm going to give you meat every day of the month. You're going to have so much meat, you're not going to know what to do with it. It's like the kid getting a job, the teenager getting a job at a pizza place. When they first start there, they're like, pizza! Whoa! Yeah, after a month, they're going, I don't want to see another one. We're going to have pizza tonight. Uh, Pizza. So he he gives them this meat for 30 days. That's his plan now. He's going to give them 30 days to let them see see this happen. But watch what Moses does here in verse 21. But Moses says, the people among you, among among whom I am, are 600,000 on foot. It's like he had to tell God that. I'm not sure God would have known that. Yet you have said, I will give them meat so that they would not eat for a whole month, that they would eat for a whole month. Should flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to be sufficient for them? Or should all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to be sufficient for them? So Moses comes back and says to him, wait a minute, that's going to bankrupt us. Moses looks around and goes, I don't know, we got that's going to take every sheep and lamb and everything that we got in all our flocks and we're going to have to fish the Red Sea dry and, and everything else to be able to have that amount of meat that you're talking about, God. Then verse 22, uh, 23, the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's power limited? I think probably Moses at that point was, uh, can I take that last statement back? <laughs> When he came face to face with, whoa, yeah, 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 wait a minute. He took us through the Red Sea, provides manna every day, water from the rock. Ah, No, his power is not limited. And then God goes on to say, now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. And so, so Moses went out, told the people the words of the Lord. Also, he gathered the 70 men of the elders and the people and stationed them around the tent. And then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to them, and he took, the, took up the spirit that was upon him and placed it upon the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do it again. So it actually happened like what God said. He got the 70 guys into the tent. The spirit that had been upon him to, to rule and to guide and everything was put upon these 70 men. And, and, and they prophesied. They showed that the spirit had come upon them to be able to do this. Now, I'm not done with the story because this is... Now I'm to the point right here. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, Eldad, and the other name was, the other one was Medad. So if you're looking for some names for kids, there you go. Eldad and Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those who had been registered but had not gone to the tent, and they prophesied in the camp. So you get the picture here? So there were 68 in the tent. These two didn't make it to the tent. They were still out in the camp. They were still doing, they were elders. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing and everything. But but what happened was when the Spirit came upon the elders in the tent, it also came on those, but they were in the camp. It didn't matter if they were in the tent. It just mattered about who they were. And here they are out in the camp, and they received the Spirit upon them. Now watch what happens. 27. So a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. There's always one of them. It's probably a little puny guy. Hey, Moses, I got something to tell you. (laughs) Something going on in the camp you should know about. I don't think it's right. And then this is, verse 28 is terrible. Then Joshua, Joshua, you know, Joshua won the battle of Jericho. That's what you played Jericho, Jericho, that Joshua. Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses. Moses, right-hand man, from his youth, been there a long time, said, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. You see the parallel with the New Testament? 
Restrain them. Man, stop them. They shouldn't be doing that. And then Moses turns around. He said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Then Moses returned to the camp, both he and the elders of Israel. He turned around and said to Joshua, wait a minute, we need more Eldads and Medads. I mean, we need more people like that. That, that, that. Yeah, there was a meeting here, but they were so busy doing what they were supposed to be doing already that they couldn't even make it to the meeting. I mean, man, we, we, we should have been, it would have been great if all 70 and said, hey, we can't make it to the tent because we're busy, you know, doing the work. But so many times, so the next two, slide, or next two things there is uh, Joshua and the young man are, uh, of the Old Testament, the OT, are John and the rest of the disciples in the New Testament. And then the next one, Moses of the Old Testament, is a picture of Jesus in the New Testament. And I, I walked all the way through that because I want you to see that, that the Old Testament and the New Testament, they come together and actually they can help you, help you understand each other that is there. Here's the beware. Beware of criticizing those who are doing the work you, we should be doing. Beware of criticizing those who are doing the work that we should be doing. Now, I want to put one little asterisk there. The work that they're doing in Christ. Not just any work, not just social work, not just good works kind of thing. The work that is done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Beware of criticizing those who are doing the work that is done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we're not doing it. So one last verse here. For whoever gives a cup of you, this is still Jesus. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. So he does something here. He says whoever, whoever, mean, meaning someone who's named or unnamed, doesn't matter. If, you got a na- if your name is John, or if you're an unnamed guy who's casting out demons. Second thing he says is he brings up a cup of water. A cup of water. It, 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 in contrast to what? This guy casting out demons. So if you, cup of water casting out demons. Cup of water casting out demons. You would probably go, cup of water casting out demons. You know, that's probably what you would do. You know, Jesus does this. Cup of water casting out demons. It doesn't matter what it is. In, in, in relative to the, 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 the magnitude of it. And then the third one is, as followers of Christ. It's done because His name is given. His name is given. In His name. I put la- one last thing down. And I put there, nothing gets by Jesus' sight. So the guy that brings a cup of water, Jesus, God's looking down going, Winner! Winner. He did it because of Christ and that they were followers of Christ. He says, winner. Guy casts out demons in Jesus' name. Winner. Winner. So two things here. Disciples needed to realize that there was a second coming of Christ. And the second coming of Christ would come with triumph. He would. But prior to that, now is the first coming of Christ and he's standing there. And he's saying to them, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to rise again. And there's going to be a gap of time between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And during this gap of time, disciples, the way my system works, the God's system works, is we need to serve him. Serve him in his name. I want you to go back to that question. If someone was going to describe you, are you selfish selfish, or selfless? What system are you operating on in your very life? I'm going to close the song by singing a song um, that we'll actually sing on Wednesday night, but I want you to just have some time with the Lord as I sing through this. Um to ask yourself and ask before the Lord that question. Am I selfish or selfless? Which am I? 
There's not too many songs that are written about the second coming of Christ. Lots of times, uh, you know, we'll have songs like, when we all get to heaven. Well, that's about us getting to heaven. Or, um, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. Yeah, that's about us getting a mansion. Um, you've got uh, maybe.